Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life Podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is Ernesto Canales, the co-founder of Latino Metrics. Latino Metrics is a weekly newsletter that delivers data visualizations, graphs, and key insights about Latin America's economics, markets, startups, and growth. Ernesto, how's it going, man? I'm doing good, Ben. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, where are, are you, where are you calling in from today? Currently, I'm only for a couple of days in Monterrey, Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm kind of getting my visa process to go back to the states, but uh, it's good to be home. I've been I've been in my hometown of Torreon, Mexico, for about the past month and a half. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember when I did a tweet about Torreon and mm-hmm. you commented on that. And I think that was one of the main ways we started a, a dialogue. Um, you know, we, we'd gone back and forth a little bit, but I think after I tweeted about Torreon, uh, you started getting a little bit more engaged in my Latin Life's content. Yeah, I think, well, it, it might have been a mix of my, Mario, my partner, and I, but uh, we really appreciate someone from outside of Mexico actually knowing Torreon. I think that's not very common to see. Um, and I think that's probably part of the reason why we were very interested. Yeah. That's awesome. So Latino metrics for people who are unfamiliar with it. Um, it's, they basically make data visualizations. They have the newsletter, they have a very, um, classic, signature eggshell background to their data visualizations. Um, and they it, it's really amazing. They're covering all of Latin America, tons about Mexico, but really every country, Peru, Uruguay, um, Brazil, everywhere in Latin America. And the visualizations really vary dramatically. So it's not just pure, boring economic stuff or business stuff. There's one where it's like, Bad Bunny's tour is the highest grossing of 2022. There's one about the the OXO uh, convenience store chain and the business of it. There's it's it's really everything. Um, the blueberry industry in Peru. It really kind of you guys touch on a lot of different topics. It's very eclectic and it's very succinct in the way that it's presented in the form of these very professional looking charts. And so I was immediately captivated by by what you guys were doing. And uh, really happy that you guys are here on the podcast to talk a little bit more uh, about Latino metrics. Uh, thanks a lot, man. That that actually means a lot. Thank you. So um, maybe, uh, Ernesto, what would be cool is if you could give us a little bit of a background on Latino metrics, uh, the inspiration, how you guys got started. Yeah, sure. I would love to. Um, so Mario and I, we are second cousins and... We both grew up in Torreon, Mexico, but what's funny is that we didn't actually know each other until we both went to the University of Texas at Austin for, uh, for college, and that's where we became pretty close friends. Um, we both graduated in economics at the university, so we shared a lot of time together. And then uh, I graduated a year before Mario, And then Mario uh, started a family and we were kind of like doing each our separate things. I went into analyst jobs in the U.S., specifically in Boston. Mario went to Europe to get his master's degree in international relations. And then after a few years, uh, I decided to quit my job. Uh, I was working at Wayfair at the time, uh, an e-commerce company from Boston. And I kind of was wanting to reconnect, honestly, with back home. I had been living in the U.S. for eight years and I wanted to kind of do something new. So I went back to Torreon for about 10 months after quitting my job at Wayfair. And it turned out that Mario was there. He was also kind of figuring things out after his master's degree. And... um we both were just like, we want to do something. We, we'd always wanted to do something 
sort of entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. but um, we never knew exactly what. And, and um, one thing that we did was Mario, for one reason or another, had access to this really uh, bad co-working space in Torreon that was like in a random... It was a, this was this random uh, neighborhood that was just it had just been built and they were trying out like how to get residents so they built this uh, tiny co-working space. Uh, it didn't even have Wi-Fi and we had to go and get the Wi-Fi ourselves. And the sun in in Torreon, in case you don't know, it hits really hard. It's like a very desert-like city, um, and so. The, it was designed in a kind of like a poor way where the sun was hitting our faces all day long. Uh, but we were like, this is a space for us to just kind of like talk, do something outside of our house. Cause we, we were both like just in our house, applying to jobs, looking for opportunities. And I think that was a really good decision because it led to different conversations. And, and ultimately Mario is the one that came up with the idea of a newsletter Mm-hmm. Uh, we were inspired by, I don't know if you're familiar with another newsletter called Charter, which also similar to us sends three data visualizations uh, every week, but they actually, what's impressive about them, they do it twice a week. Um, and Mario had the idea of saying, why don't we do that, but focused on Latin America? Because, and, and the thought process there was, there's really uh, nothing like that in the region. And there are very few publications that actually try to cover the region as a whole. So we think that there's not a ton of competition. And we had both been followers of, of publications like Morning Brew or The Hustle. And we had seen their success. So at, at first I was like, I don't know, Mario, that's not my idea of entrepreneurship, to be honest. And so I had to think about it for a couple of days. But then I realized, you know what, it's a, it's a good idea because it costs us nothing. It's a good mix of both of our skills. Um, and so I said, I want to commit to it for six months. Let's just do it, see what happens. And that's sort of how it was born. We we jo- we uh, met in that co-working space and kind of like together came up with the, the name and the brand and the logo and everything. Um, and then it was just, it, it was pretty scary because you know, we started with the commitment of, okay, we're going to send three charts per week. But at the, on week one, we didn't, it's not like we had like five months of content to publish. We had zero. So we're just like, okay, we'll just try it out. Um, and Yeah, I had a question about the content. So did you have the idea to build a newsletter before you guys even started making d- data visualizations? Or did you start making the visualizations first and then figure out how to monetize it? It was, um, it, it, it sort of came together. And again, I want to give all the credit where credit is due to this newsletter called Charter, Chart R, uh, because that concept was invented by them where it's like, it's a newsletter and each newsletter comes with three charts. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we kind of like committed to. And, and I thought that was a pretty good um system because it made us commit and have like a system okay we need to produce three charts per week i i can i sort of like that as a you know Mm -hmm. this is the output that we need to be bringing every week and we can't miss versus just saying let's just build a chart let's just make a chart here and there and publish it on social media okay so it kind of happened at the same time yeah it kind of happened at the same time and uh, you know what's cool? I'm looking at Charter now. I've, I've definitely seen a little bit of their charts in the past. Yeah. Um, it's more, I guess, about the American economy and American yeah, startups absolutely. and stuff. Yeah. They have about 11,000 followers on Twitter. And yeah. you guys, Latino Metrics, has 52,000 followers on Twitter. Yeah. So you guys yeah. have already greatly subpa- surpassed uh, your original inspiration. Yeah. I Well... Uh, uh, thank you for that uh, on Twitter, certainly. But uh, if you look at their newsletter numbers, we're nowhere near what they have. I mean, their whole focus is more so on the newsletter itself that they send to email subscribers, mm-hmm. and they're pretty huge. I mean, it's uh, obviously they have a much bigger audience that they can reach, but uh, 
yeah, they're they're not as present on social media as we are, whereas we have been very uh, consistent of every single chart that we put on our newsletter. We'll make a Twitter thread for it and we'll put publish it on every... We even publish on like Facebook where we, we've seen very little growth. So uh, it, it's, it's sort of like a different uh, focus. But we've actually talked to the founder and we've told him that he should he should probably publish a little more on social media. <laughs> yeah, so Latino Metrics also has 13,000 followers on Instagram, not too shabby. I see yeah. you guys started posting there around October 2021. So that's yeah. about eh, more or less a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, how how long how long ago did you guys make your first chart? Uh, we started by the end of October 2021. That was our first chart, and um, where where we've actually seen the most growth is on LinkedIn. I don't know if you ever checked us out there, but that that's mm-hmm. where we have about sixty six thousand followers, and um, the the what was very interesting for us was the the very first week. Um, we published on Reddit on, I don't know if you're familiar with the subreddit called data is beautiful, but, um, no, but I saw, I think you guys even have your own subreddit now. Uh, no, it's actually the, our handle, but same thing. Um, yeah, there's, okay. there's a subreddit called data is beautiful and it actually has, what's amazing about Reddit is they have, this subreddit has 19 million, uh, members in, mm-hmm. in data is beautiful. So if your chart is good, you can actually have an amazing reach on Reddit mm-hmm. without any followers. Like on Reddit, it's not really about followers, but it's about producing content that is interesting to a community. Mm-hmm. And what was amazing was on our very first week, we published a chart about how poverty in Latin America, extreme poverty especially, had dropped since the, I think it was since the 1920s or something. Mm-hmm. And on our very first week, we went to like the front page of Data is Beautiful, and we had like I don't know a million impressions. And we're awesome. Like okay, that that was very validating, you know. It's like okay, we're we're clearly onto something here, and I think publishing in as many places as possible really uh, has paid off for us. Yeah. So I see. Uh, just to buckle the buckle on Charter. It's a, according to their website, they have over 300,000 people subscribed to their newsletter. Do yeah. you guys, uh, are you willing to share how many people you, how many subscribers you have? That's, yeah, that's incredible. 300,000. Um, we're nowhere near there. We have close to 9,000. And I think that's, that's why I was make I made sure to call out the newsletter because I think, there's two things. First, in Latin America, I think the the culture of subscribing to newsletters is not as strong. So, <laughs> yeah, so, that's, that's probably an understatement. Yeah, exactly. So there's that. And then the second piece is we kind of put out all of our content on social media. So I think there's a lot of people that say, so why, why would I subscribe to your newsletter if everything's like I can just, I guess I can just follow you on Twitter. And so the benefit that we give to our, um, we have... We have the option to become a premium subscriber and we have a we have a domingo brief that we send we call it the domingo brief where we kind mm-hmm. of do very short stories all around the region and we get give our subscribers first access to all of our charts um every wednesday and it has more we try to build more of a community feeling but we we we're hoping to do more work in that front to have a better offering in the future yeah, tell us about the Domingo Brief. Yeah, the Domingo Brief um, was the idea that we're sort of limited by the content that we can make by this concept of making charts. Because if you think about it, there's a lot of very interesting data points by themselves that are not really chartable, but are just as like insightful or valuable that we didn't want to be limited by that. And so... We and I also had just read the concept of smart brevity that Axios employs. And Axios is a, a huge media company that sold for like half a billion dollars last year, and their whole thing is smart brevity. And smart brevity is this concept about uh, the founders of Axios sort of coined it, and 
it, it speaks to how nobody really, or not, they, they sort of exaggerated, but they said that most people don't read long form content anymore. Like mm -hmm. if you, if they, they did some analysis and like something like 95% of people don't read an entire piece of long form content. And so they kind of took that to an extreme and they, all of their reporting is super brief and very like bullet point oriented. And so I was like, wow, it's, it's really interesting. I, I want to kind of merge those two concepts of very brief sort of stories, but that have our flavor of data and insights and things and uh, that captures all of Latin America into mm -hmm. Domingo Brief. And um, uh, right around the same time, this guy, Gabriel Cohen, uh, sort of emailed us out of the blue saying that he really liked what we did and that he wanted to be part of our project. And we're like, we saw his resume and it was definitely very impressive. He, he has actual journalism experience, whereas Mario and I don't. And we sort of thought, okay, maybe this is perfect for him. And so we have him kind of write up a draft and literally two days after talking to him, he had a draft ready and it looked great. They were like, okay, that's perfect. Uh, Gabriel Cohn, you're, you're going to be in charge of the Domingo Brief. Yeah. So I saw that you guys started uh, bringing on some writers. Um, I wanted to finish the question about the the, um, the paid subscribers I had, yeah. which was, um, so if someone's listening to this and they want to sign up for yeah. uh, Latino Metrics paid service, is it through Substack or is that just a subset is, is, is that just one way to sign up or is, or is the, is it primarily through Substack? Yeah, no, it's, it's the only way to sign up. If uh, you can go to latinometrics.com and it'll write it out you to our Substack landing page. Um, that's pretty much our own, uh, our, the extent of our website. I do want to have like a landing page that's more customized for us at some point, but right now, yeah, the, the only way to sign up is through Substack. Sweet. So everyone, Substack, Latino Metrics. It's honestly amazing. If anyone's listening to this and they haven't seen uh, Latino Metrics graphics, data visualizations, they're honestly amazing. They've got to, they've got to be world class. Um, speaking of, so who actually creates the graphics? Yeah, so it's it's a team effort. Um, I so the the way our process sort of works is we we always have ideas on the pipeline but only a subset of those can ever be turned into a chart. And the way it works is Mario and I have this specific channel for just sharing ideas um, where we, we follow a ton of accounts that do similar things to us. We follow a bunch of newsletters. We, we sort of keep up with the news. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and over time, we've grown to be better at having like interesting sources that can give us ideas. And then from there, every week, I dive into our database of ideas and then just sort of like try to chart three things. And the way I do it is through this um, open source website, which is amazing. It's called rawgraphs.io. Mm -hmm. And um, you can literally just copy and paste an Excel spreadsheet into there and then graph kind of like as you would with Tableau software. And then you just download like a file that's a, that's a SVG is what it's called. And then Mario has more of the graphic design experience. So he turns the, the very raw uh, chart that I, that I created into more of like the design and product that, that you see every week. Mm -hmm. Because it's a good mix of, of graphing styles. Um, you know, it's bar charts, it's line charts. I kind of forget mm -hmm. the names of these things, uh, pie charts, right? right? So it's, it's like almost every one of them visually looks different. And you guys have hundreds of them at this point, and they all look visually quite different and all very appealing, um, in terms of like colors and layout and stuff yeah. like that. Um, it's, it's very, it's very impressive. Thanks, man. Um, I think something that really helped us out also is I have a friend that, Literally, her profession is color theory. And I reached out to her when we started. And I was like, we have not, like, we were not very consistent with the colors. 
can you help us out? And she offered to make us like a color palette. And mm-hmm. that has helped us so much to like sort of be very, to be able to vary the colors every time, but at the same time have consistency. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, what we try to do every week is we try not to send the same style of chart twice in one week. So if we try to just have one bar chart every week. Yeah, I noticed most, that. Most, it, it's hard because bar chart is honestly the most common. <laughs> and, and our most viral charts are bar charts because they're so easy to read. Um, but uh, yeah, we tried, I, what I try to do every week is like keep a balance between the topics and the types of charts that we, that we do. Yeah. So hopefully this isn't too boring to the listeners that we're nerding out about charts a little bit. Uh, one last question, because th- this is going to be an epic one to solidify forever. Who decided to do the blue border with the eggshell background? Oh, man, that's a good question. I actually don't. I'm not sure because we were both very involved in the design. I can tell you that Mario coined the name Latino Metrics. All the credit goes to him. But the the background, I think it was my idea. I, I think we wanted to have a more sort of distinguished background that our, our thought when we were starting out was let's have some, let's have a brand that's serious, but not too serious. Um, and that the branding of each chart is very apparent because I think a lot of people just see charts online and they have no idea who made it and they don't really give a shit, honestly. So uh, what we wanted to do is, make sure that our branding is very strong on each chart so that you that's recognize good. a Latino metrics chart. Yeah, that's good. Cause if I see a chart, even if it didn't, even if you stripped out the Latino metrics logo, I would mm-hmm. still know it was you guys. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're definitely going for. And so we said we were very selective about our font and our, uh, and the background, I think the background was my idea. Um, but it's definitely not, I'm not the first one to do, like financial times, has a very similar background. Oh, that's true. That is true. Because even the, the physical newspaper of the Financial Times has like a eggshell tinge to it, almost like rosy color. Yeah. And I, I, I always like that. I, we, I wanted to do the same thing. Ah, there you go. Yeah. So I was curious about the, the demographics of the fan base. Do you have a sense for how much of your fan base are people from Latin America versus yeah. maybe from the States or outside of the, of Latin America that are sort of learning about this region? Yeah, I think we can get a pretty good sense from LinkedIn, which is where we have most of our followers. Um, LinkedIn, I think is the only place where you can actually see a breakdown like that. Instagram also kind of, I think, but since we don't have as many followers there, I think it's worse. Mm-hmm. Um, on LinkedIn, we have about, let's say, I think it was like, obviously because most our topics tend to favor Mexico because that's what we know. Mm-hmm. That's our number one um, following follower place. But roughly it's like 60% is Mexico and Brazil. And then it's like, 20% USA and then the rest is the rest of Latin America basically. Wow, so you think your audience is 80% Latino? Uh I I I actually might need to revisit that. I think it might be more like 70 and 30 is like a mix of the US and outside of Latam. Mm-hmm. Uh but yeah, it's definitely mostly Latino for sure. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool because yeah. obviously the uh, the My Latin Life audience is more, um, I guess, more North Americans and Europeans that right. are learning about the region and they right. look to us to basically get, you know, tips and tricks and inspiration and learn about Latin America. We definitely have certainly a lot of followers from Latin America, but I would say the majority um, is from, uh, uh, you know, is not yeah. Yeah, that definitely makes makes a lot of sense. Um, we, we we for that same reason of we wanted to capture that audience of 
people that are interested in Latin America is why we publish in English. And I think it was a very good decision when we started. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you had uh, been aware of uh, my Latin life for a little bit. Was mm -hmm. uh, would, would love for you to kind of stroke our, e our ego a little bit and just tell us maybe what you noticed about my Latin life. And I guess this sort of like, because we kind of are approaching in some ways the same the same goal, which is educating yeah. people about Latin America. Yep. I, I, what I really love about your uh, page is the positivity which, with which you talk about Latin America. I think that's sort of what we've probably both discovered is that there's a hunger for that sort of um, uh, content, mm -hmm. both from apparently from, from you guys' end, it's like from people that are interested in the region more so and that live there as outsiders. And I love that, you know, I think I really, it's very refreshing to see the immigration experience into Latin America from people that actually take an interest into, uh, into Latin America. Like the fact that you guys know Torreon tells me everything I need to know about... <laughs> how much you actually care about the place you live in. Whereas I think um, a criticism of the other side of the coin could be that there, there's definitely a lot of people that just go to the resort uh, in Cancun, stay there for a week and then leave. Right. So I think I, I find it fascinating that experience of people that decided to move there. And I honestly don't know enough people as someone that kind of did the opposite thing going from, Mexico to the United States. Uh, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting as many people like you. So that's sort of how I was fascinated by your account. And at the same time, it doesn't take itself very seriously. Like you guys make a lot of very funny uh, uh, posts and, and maps and all, all sorts of things. So I, I, I think that that's kind of like something that we have in common, you know, um, we talk about serious things, about good things that are happening in Latin America, but we also, we don't try to take ourselves too seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely have a policy where uh, I really don't talk about violence. I don't talk about um, uh, safety or unsafety that much. Um, I have yeah. certain topics that I, I really just, uh, just a, as a matter of preference, I suppose, or policy. Yeah. Uh, I try not, you know, I think they're already sort of trite and, and over talked about. So we try to, there, and there's so much to talk about anyway, that's positive that um, it's might as well just spend our time uh, sharing the positivity and, and teaching people about uh, the, the, the benefits of the region. Right. If, if somebody wants to know why they need to be scared about Latin America, they just need to read any like American newspaper, <laughs> just like Google I don't know, Fox News, Mexico or whatever. And you can get, you can learn about the very biased topics about why uh, some parts of Mexico are unsafe and things that are designed to scare. And I think we made the same decision early on where we want to focus on the positives. We've definitely broken that a few times. Like when we think the topic is interesting enough and not very talked about, Mm -hmm. uh, we we break that rule. Like for example, we made a chart about the addiction of Coca Cola in in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, that, that one's awesome. <laughs> Specifically in in Chiapas, Mexico. Yeah, I mean, obviously not a very positive story, but it's like okay, no, nobody. That was good though because uh, uh, I I saw that about Chiapas and I was like, do they really drink that much Coca Cola in Chiapas? And then that yeah. I don't know if there was directly a link on your thread. But I ended up on YouTube and I watched a whole documentary about the Coca-Cola factory in Chiapas and and everything. And and yeah. now that I'm in Mexico, now that I'm in Mexico again, I'm like acutely aware of how much Coca-Cola they're drinking. Yo, literally yesterday, yesterday I went to the dentist here in Mexico and uh, I had to um, drop by someone's house before the dentist because uh, there, there were actually uh, a few of us going to the dentist. And mm -hmm. the other people I was going to the dentist with, they were drinking Coca-Cola before the dentist. 
Yeah, man. It's, uh, and I was like, what are you guys doing? Like, we're going, vamos al dentista. And they're like, no, don't worry. We're just going to brush our teeth. I'm like, this is nuts. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty ridiculous. I mean, I thought it was bad in Torreon, where I'm from, where, like, it's not uncommon to have breakfast with a Coca-Cola. <laughs> but, but Chiapas is just on a different level. It's, it's crazy. And, and that documentary that you mentioned, I think I must have watched the same one. It's just fascinating to see how some people actually believe it has uh, like, like spiritual religious properties or whatever. Uh, healing properties. It's, uh, <laughs> it's amazing. So it's funny. It's funny. And then another one, uh, I'm actually in Jalapa right now. And you guys did one about Chedrawi, which is the uh, grocery store chain. And yeah. I like screenshotted like every um, post, every tweet in the thread, you know, sent it to some of my friends here in Jalapa so that they could sort of learn about Chedrawi. Because one of the things I noticed about Latinos is Latinos, like they don't really like study business or they don't study like the important people in their local economy. Like uh -huh. they sort of, they sort of have a sense of like, who are the rich families of the region, but they don't yeah. really understand like who is behind the products that they buy or who is like, who's right. kind of taking care of things at a macro level. And so I shared this thing and they're like, oh, wow. Like Chedroe, like, yeah, I guess I heard it was a Lebanese guy and that's all they know, but they ended up yeah. learning so much more. They learned about how it's, um, we learned about how. Chedraui is actually bigger now in the United States than it is in Mexico, et cetera. So it's super educational. Yeah, really, that's a very interesting point. I hadn't thought about that. But if you think about it, there's entrepreneurs and like founders in Mexico don't have as much of the celebrity or recognized profile as you see in the U.S. Uh, that's, that's a very interesting point. Uh, but yeah, and to be quite honest, like, I would have never, would have, if I didn't run Latino Metrics, I would have never known the name of the Chedrawi founder. To be 100% honest, I forgot his name. I, I, I know I wrote about him. I think it's but I forgot. Right. Yeah, okay. So I, I, I'm part of that kind of culture where I, I don't, I think business people are not as interested in having like a super high profile in Mexico. It's true because of like the, unfortunately, like the kidnapping issue and so forth. So I think people are much more, I think yeah. probably that. Maybe you could tell me like, why do you think, why do you think uh, business leaders are so much more low key in Latin America? Because yeah, let's, yeah, I'm curious. What do you think? Why do you think people like business leaders are so much more low key? I'm thinking about it. I think what you mentioned is probably definitely part of it. Um, the the just safety uh i i i'm not 100 percent sure i maybe part of the reason is also th the fact that the you know in the u.s the economy is a lot more uh kind of evenly distributed across the entire population so like people th there's what i guess i'm saying people there's a bigger middle class that would take interest in such topics. Whereas in Mexico, I think the, the middle class is not as strong. Um, so that's probably not the best theory. I don't, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here. I think your yeah, theory. I know like when I was like in high school and stuff and I was like, I want to be a billionaire one day, I was studying all the billionaires in Canada and the U S I was reading, uh, you know, the Forbes 30 under 30, I was reading the Midas list. I was reading basically like everything about like, who are the top guys so that I could learn about guys and girls. So I could learn about their lives and sort of emulate what they're doing and, um, learn like what businesses they run, who owns what business, you know, who owns the, the, the common logos that we see in our daily lives. And I find that, uh, in Latin America, they don't have as much interest in knowing who are the people behind certain brands. Like they won't yeah. know who owns a given sports team, for example. Yeah. And um, I, I think that's really cool. I think Latino metrics is uh, contributing to, you know, digging up some of that knowledge about Latin America and, and teaching people yeah. about, um, you know, the business and economics and so forth of the region startups. Yeah. Yeah. That's my favorite story to tell. It's like a, 
very uh, low key person that did something amazing that nobody really talks about. And I think a good example of that is the guy that brought uh, blueberries to Peru. Mm-hmm. He like just experimented with different blueberries that he brought from Chile and started like a blueberry boom in the country. And you don't really hear too much about him. So that was a very fun story to like research and write about. Um, but I think, think about the, back to the question that you were asking. If you, if you also think about it, like, I think it's the fact that in Mexico, there's a lot more boring companies than in the U S because now I'm thinking about like, for example, do you know who the CEO of, let's say the company three M is nobody has probably heard of his name and, and, uh, his comp- whoever that guy is, his company does amazing every year. And it's been around for like, I think a hundred years at this point, but in Mexico there's, uh, but on the other side of that is all these very high, super high profile companies like Meta, Twitter, Tesla, obviously all of those companies, we all know who the entrepreneurs are, but yeah. sadly in Mexico, there's not, not, nothing such, nothing of quite that level. Um, mm-hmm. There's the richest man at some point was Carlos Slim, who created the one of the biggest telecom companies in the world. Mm-hmm. He's certainly high profile, but there's just not as many cases of like very exciting companies that did something as disruptive, unfortunately, as in the like US. Like, for States. example, I was, you know, I was using Salsa Valentina. And I asked people, I was like, who actually owns Salsa Valentina? Where, like, what even, what even region of Mexico is Valentina from? And no one knew anything about Valentina, even yeah. though they use it every single day. And it's like one of Mexico's most well-known brands. And so yeah. I went and I started looking it up a little bit. And I'm like, okay, like, it looks like it's getting bottled in Jalisco near Guadalajara. Okay. And then I started looking up a little bit the ownership structure and it looked like kind of um, some of these families that owned like sugar processing plants um, and were f- originally started in the sugar industry. It looks like they started it. And so I started looking it up and learning about it. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, if you can bring stories like that to the forefront, that's uh, like that's an amazing service. Yeah, that's actually uh, Salsa Valentina is definitely if there was if there were uh, good data for that. We would love to make a chart about Salsa Valentina because it's an <laughs> iconic uh, part of our supermarkets. Like I remember when that Salsa Valentina was like seven pesos mm-hmm. for like a big bottle of it. Right now, I don't know how much it costs, but I always found it amazing how cheap it was and how good it was for the cost. Yeah. So you said, so it says on the website that the purpose of Latino metrics is to help Latin America and its decision makers, entrepreneurs, investors, economists, policymakers, and business leaders make sense of the region's market and growth opportunities. Um, Do you have a sense of what investors and high level policymakers and stuff are, are starting to, to pay attention to um, the content that you guys are putting out has has starting Latino metrics kind of gotten you guys in front of um, I don't know the inner circle of the Latin America business community. Uh, it's actually yeah, it's very interesting. I think that's one of the biggest surprises that we've uh, taken from since we started is just the very high profile people that have taken an interest in our content. Um, just a few weeks ago, for example, uh, ex-president of Costa Rica followed us on Twitter. Um, Sergio Sarmiento, who's like uh, my family's idol and a very famous radio host in, in Mexico since I was a little kid, followed us on Twitter. I DM'd him and I was like, man, this is great. Thank you for following us. Um, that, that I think has been the biggest surprise since starting is just the, the quality of followers that we've been lucky to to receive. That's at the same time a big responsibility. Uh, but it's it's honestly like it, it has definitely opened doors for us in terms of like we we can have conversations with very interesting people. Um, 
if if we want to or need to. But we haven't explored to what extent, like how much our anal our analyses, our charts have influenced actual decision making by by leaders. I think that's really hard to measure. Um, but we have definitely seen evidence of that from like news outlets picking up our our mm -hmm. publications and uh, like Sergius Armento re retweeting us. All of that, I think, is evidence that we're saying things that people weren't aware about or that were very surprised by. Uh, I, I think a good example, and just to name one example, is a few maybe last week we published a chart about how Uruguay reduced their informality sector by half in like 10 years. Yeah, and that I was think, cool. yeah, that was very cool. And I think the fact that it got so much attention, I, I didn't even expect it to be that um, big on Twitter, but it, it did. And I think what that speaks to is uh, policymakers taking an interest on on okay how can we do things better like there's this case of a country that was able to solve this very big problem for a country um, and I hope that by learning from that case or being just simply being aware of it they can make uh, future decisions so that's kind of like the sentiment behind that uh, statement that you just read yeah, dude, I, I guarantee that you guys are making a huge impact. Like, I guarantee if you guys went to any sort of business conference in Latin America, like a, a significant portion of people there, journalists, et cetera, would know who you are. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. It's, it's been definitely very surprising. Like, I, I've had uh, random people tell me that, I don't know, they're doing their MBA and they're uh, Latin friends all know about Latino metrics and it's just, it's crazy to think about because like I said, we started with zero expectations. We're, we're just committed to something and, and it's, it's been great to see it pay off. Not in a monetary sense too much, but in a, you know, like I love doing it every week and, and it's just, I think a very cool mission that, that we can um, try to achieve every week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if you had to explain the landscape of the Latin tech startup scene, like how, how would you describe it? How would you tell someone to start learning about it? You know, I'm, I'm familiar with the Robbie J. Fry podcast and the Croc Cracks podcast with Oso Trava. And those mm -hmm. guys do a good job of interviewing a lot of these um Latino startup leaders and CEOs yeah. and, and business leaders. And um, like beyond maybe those guys or like what, what are some good ways to get a sense of the, the startup community and to start um, getting involved with that? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think the, the ones that you mentioned are great. Um, it's, I, I think However, the podcast world, especially like serious podcasting, I think there's a lot of very silly podcasts uh, in Mexico about that are funny and about not startups. But I think it's ultimately reading. And I think there are good sources like El Economista in, in Mexico, El País, but at the same time, those those newspapers don't really talk too much about startups. So I think you you need to really dig for alternative um, media in this sense. And where you find that is with people that are actually within the space. And a good example is Fran Garcia. I think I hope I'm getting his name right on Twitter. Um, he how he's you, actually how you his first name. Franci Let me make sure I have his name Fran right. Fran Garcia. Fran Garcia. Um, he's an example of someone that wasn't is in venture capital and is vocal on Twitter. He actually also has a podcast where he interviews um, VCs. But uh, it's definitely a challenge because, at least for us, for that same limit limitation that we have of we need to make charts. 
there's not a lot of data that's public out there for about startups. So we don't, we wish we could talk about them more. Um, but I think the best way is just finding key people that are very involved in the space. I think another person that I just thought about is Lolita on Twitter, Lolita Taub. She's actually American from, from California, I think, but she, she talks, she's very involved in Latin American uh, startups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it, honestly, it's just finding people that are involved there. If you really want to dive into it, do you think that uh, Twitter is the best place to to find people in Latin tech? Yeah, I would say Twitter and, and LinkedIn, probably to a lesser extent LinkedIn, but yeah, Twitter. If I had to pick, definitely. Ernesto, it makes me think a bit about your trajectory because I guess you grew up in Torreon. Uh, you somehow made your way to UT Austin, which is an excellent school. I'm kind of curious how that came about and how you uh, developed an interest in, in startups and tech. Yeah, um, so that's a pretty long story, actually, because I, I was in high school and I had no, when I first started, um, well, it wasn't a little bit earlier than high school, I had no intent on going to to an American university, partly because it wasn't something that was very much talked about. Uh, I was part of Tech de Monterrey. I'm sure you know that school. It's the biggest uh, private university in Mexico and one of the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. We actually made a chart about that. But the 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 high school also has a university. So if you think about it, they don't really have an incentive to have students sort of uh, be applying to American universities, whereas that's not the case for other um, private uh, high schools in, in the country. They, they might be a little bit more willing to facilitate that, like taking the SAT and all those things that you need to do to get into a good school. But... Um, my brother was in college and he, he we all visited the ut campus i don't know where he got that idea that he wanted to transfer from tech de monterey into ut and so we all got to visit the campus and sort of talk about what that would look like and i remember seeing i was just like blown away because i had never been to austin the experiences that i had going to texas were like going shopping to San Antonio as, as it's <laughs> common for the northerners in Mexico. So I hadn't seen much of the state and much less Austin. And I just thought it was like a very unique, cool city. And uh, so that kind of like planted a seed in my brain that I wanted to, to apply. And then actually something that happened in my personal life was a month after that trip, my dad passed away. And... At this, and during that trip, he, he also sort of was very excited to have me apply. My brother actually never ended up transferring, but that just kind of stayed with me. And, and I worked hard to, to go to UT. I actually, the first time I applied, I didn't get in. And that's because my grades weren't great. And I... I actually applied to really, a really tough school, which is the engineering school. And, but I was like very set on going. So I actually took a sabbatical and I applied again. And I worked on my SAT to make up for my grades and I ended up going. And I think it's one of the best decisions I've made in my life. That's amazing. Yeah. Because you alluded to it earlier at the beginning of the episode, how we kind of had the opposite experience, right? You are a Mexican that made his way to the United States to study at a top tier American university, study engineering too, I believe, right? Um, so I, wanted I, first, I ended up doing economics, yeah. Economics, very good. And then, you know, uh, me and a, a lot of the people listening to this, they might have the opposite experience where we're from North America and right. we're tired of the bad weather and high cost of living and so forth. And we've uh, decided to make our way down to Latin America. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of, uh, we're having the opposite experience. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so funny. I, 
but I'm so, I feel like I'm I'm like four or five steps behind you. I feel like I'm gonna get tired of the cold weather because after living five years in Boston, I'm also kind of of the mind of why do I keep putting up with these uh, <laughs> insane? First of all, insane rents in uh, Beacon Hill in Boston for nice area. Uh, literally big, living in inside of a shoebox and a landlord that's very unresponsive. And then it's just cold half of the year. Why am I here? Uh, part of the answer is that my girlfriend is from Connecticut. So um, that's why I'm there. But I, I feel like in a few years, I'm going to be like, you know what? Uh, back to Latin America. It is. Do you think she'll be down to move to Latin America? Yeah. Yeah, I think she will. Um, we want to we wanna try out the whole Austin thing for a bit. Mm-hmm. And, and, but we, we have talked about at least for some years, we want to live in Mexico again. I want her to, to learn proper Spanish. Do you have, I know you tweet a lot of tips about how to do that. And I actually shared with her one of yours. You, it was the listen to you. I think you listen to two or three Spanish podcasts every day. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, I, I yeah. told her. I sent her that, and she was like, "There's no way I could like absorb any of that." <laughs> yeah, podcasts was definitely one of the biggest things that helped me get there. I remember when I started listening to podcasts in Spanish, I would understand maybe twenty percent, and it would just be the words like "impresionante," right? That sound like English. <laughs> That'd be yeah. like impressive, impresionante. Got it. And um, <laughs> I don't know. Just to, eventually, it started. Um, you start filling in the gaps more and um, like now yeah. I'm, now I feel very comfortable. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the other advice you gave is uh, I don't know if this was a type of what you said, Spanish movies with Spanish subtitles, isn't it? Spanish movies with English subtitles. No, it's gotta be Spanish subtitles because if you watch something with subtitles in your native language, it's just going to be like training wheels and you're never going to, you're going to, it's going to be a crutch and you're going to be yeah. dependent on it. So you have to, li- you have to like, for example, I, I, I watch in Spanish and I also watch in Portuguese. Um, but I was watching a uh, cafe con aroma de mujer. I just finished that up. Nice. And, um, you know, I'm watching it in Spanish and I'm reading the Spanish subtitles. So I'm starting to associate what I'm listening to with, you know, how it's written and everything. And it, um, that, yeah. That's the way you got to do it. If if I was watching that novella with English subtitles, I, I would have learned nothing because I would have just been you just, you like I, I would have just been reading. Yeah, You're I have a buddy. You know the show Naruto? It's like a Japanese anime. I've heard of it a lot. I have a lot of friends that are into it, but I don't. I, I, I think it's like a thousand episodes, maybe more. It's <laughs> crazy, and it's all in Japanese. And I have a buddy, and he watched every single episode with English subtitles. And, uh, wow. and I, I, I talked to him like the week he finished it and I said, wow, you must've learned a bunch of Japanese from watching a thousand episodes of a Japanese show. And he's like, no, I didn't learn a single thing. That's, <laughs> that is all that, that's, that's so true because I've seen, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the show dark on Netflix. It's on, it's in German. No, but tell me it's a, well, it's just a German show and I, I watched it with English subtitles and like you said, I'd learn zero words of um, German. So now that you, now that I, you made me think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so there you go, guys. Up to recommend if you, if you haven't seen it yet in Spanish is Shrek. Have you heard about this? Shrek is better in Spanish than in English. Okay. Tell me why. Well, the voices of the characters of Burro, and Shrek are really famous Mexican art, uh, actors, and they're they're great. Uh, Eugenio Derbez, who is now actually getting big in Hollywood too, but he's the voice of Burro, mm-hmm. uh, the donkey. And Shrek, I forget who the actor for Shrek is, but I guarantee it, you will not regret it. Watch Shrek in Spanish; it's really well translated. And honestly, in general, all the sort of animated, big budget movies are are very well done in Spanish. It's true. I watched uh, The Grinch uh, over the Christmas break in Spanish. And uh, yeah, that was good. That was very yeah. good. Because nice. my, yeah. my, my girlfriend, she would quote The Grinch like 
she'd be quoting the Spanish version of it. And she'd be like saying things. She would just like quote it randomly. And I'd be like, what is that? And I'd be like, oh, it's like the, <laughs> and I'd be like, you're, you're, you're quoting like a dubbed thing, like not even the original, but it, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if she likes it better. <laughs> yeah, um, no. Okay. You like, uh, you like so I, I know you don't have too, too much time, but uh, I know we wanted to touch on one or two more topics. Um, sure. I know you wanted to weigh in a little bit on the controversy of digital nomads in Latin America, right? Um, yeah. Obviously, there's big pros and cons. Digital nomads from Canada and the USA and Europe are moving to Latin America. Um, you know, we're bringing a lot of FDI, foreign direct investment into the region. Um, we're, you know, uh, you, you're even starting to see North Americans contributing to the startup ecosystem in Latin America. I think Robbie J. Fry is a good example of that because he's like, yeah. I think he's from like Oregon or something. And he, um, you know, he's like started a pot anyway. So there's lots of guys, uh, there's, there's lots of positives of, um, all this talent and money flowing into Latin America, but there's lots of right. negative aspects as well. Right. Cause, um, yeah. people are complaining that it's pushing up the cost of living. People are complaining that it's gen gentrifying neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Um, would love to get your take on it, Ernesto. Yeah, that's, uh. I would love to also hear your take on it, but my personal take is that gentrification is something that happens everywhere in the world with or without um, people from richer countries immigrating. Um, and like you said, it has a lot of pros and cons. I think it's honestly just a uh, natural cycle of a city that is growing. For example, right now, like I said, I'm in Monterrey. Specifically, I'm in the wealthy part of Monterrey that's called San Pedro. Mm -hmm. And um, you see gentrification clear as day here. And, and I don't think that is driven by digital nomads or uh, too much of like Americans immigrating here. That is because there's a need for as, a, as the economy of the city keeps growing, there's a need for housing that fits the needs of people that are a bit more affluent. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. that drives the people in the surrounding areas uh, out in some cases. In some cases, though, it's, it can be good if, if they have property that they acquired a long time ago and, and it just goes up a ton in value. So it's honestly very, very definitely a very hard topic I, I i can't say that i nor i would trust him on the say it's ultimately all good or ultimately all bad but uh i think what i'm very curious to hear from you is like your own experience as as someone that i think you've said you've been living in latin america for uh is it eight years now uh, what your uh, experience has been with the receptions of the locals, right? Have you seen like negativity in interactions with local people or is that sort of just something that you see online? Uh, I'm very uh, sort of not very uh, experienced in the topic because all I see is online. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's why I wanted to hear from you personally, like what's been your experience? Yeah, well, Ernesto, obviously we're we're here to listen to you, uh, the uh, the expert, the co-founder of uh, Latino Metrics. So I, I do want to kind of keep the focus on you. I think you made okay. an an excellent example with San Pedro in yeah. Monterrey because yeah. uh, digital nomads do pop into Monterrey. Not too many living there, but they do pop in from time to time. And I always tell them to go to San Pedro, which is kind of like the most upscale, my understanding is somewhat walkable neighborhood uh, in Monterey. I think there's, you know, some, some nightclubs there and uh, fancy yeah. cafes and Starbucks and stuff. Right. And so yeah. we, we tell people, we always tell people to go to that sort of uh, vortex zone, as we like yeah. to call it, where you have the gym and the cafe and the nightclub and walkable. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's a very good example that you're bringing up that, the the um, development that happened in San Pedro was was not because of digital nomads. It's something. No. Um, it's a, 
a, sort of a different macro trend or at least something with different causes, right? Yeah, it's, I think it's what follows development of literally any place is going to have some form of gentrification. And if you think of it, it happens worldwide, like even in the first world in the United States, that happens. Gentrification is not exclusive to La Condesa or Polanco. Not at all. Like Boston, for example, I learned about how the West End uh, was gentrified. It used to be an area for the working class that worked in factories and slowly Boston became a more tech technology oriented uh, city mm -hmm. and there was a lot of more need for housing for people in the service industry that had a little bit more money or a lot more money and that displaced the people that used to live in Boston's West End but it's just a natural part of growth and, and it's I think almost impossible to to prevent because uh, you need to at, at the end of the day you need to have uh people that are pushing yeah. the economy forward live somewhere and they're always going to want a nicer place. So I, it's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, and, and a good example of that is I think a lot of people, do you know what the Gini coefficient is? Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. I've heard of it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a coefficient that measures inequality in a country. And if you think about it, Whenever a country has huge economic development, Gini coefficient goes up for a little bit because uh, people at the very top get very wealthy. And actually, uh, an easier form to an easier way of visualizing this is: imagine you there's a private island, and in this private island, there's only 10 people, and uh, and let's call it this is not actually a private island. Sorry. Uh, very independent country with just 10 people. And then all of a sudden, Bill Gates decides to move to this country that is only of 10 people mm -hmm. and him. And then it's 11 people, but one of them is a billionaire that is worth like millions of times over the people that originally lived in, in this island. Well, the Gini coefficient that measures this is going to go through the roof, right? But at the same time, him moving to this island, what does that mean for the for the lives of the people there? It likely, it very likely means that they are also going to get eventually very wealthy. Maybe not all 10 of them, but the lives of them are going to improve most likely. So that's, I think, a good illustration of, of gentrification in a very simple way. It's like e economic development always comes with some inequality at first. And, and, there, and honestly, in, Economic inequality always will exist, but um, I think it's an inevitable part of growth in a country. So that's sort of my position. I, I think digital nomads ultimately in Mexico are a good thing in the, in the long term. And in some cases, for a lot of people in the short term, because they create business opportunities for, for people that are there. There's evidence also that um, entrepreneurs and not even entrepreneurs, but professionals arriving to Mexico uh, foster an environment of more innovation and mm -hmm. that always is good for the economy. So I think ultimately it's a good thing. Uh, what do you think are some of the other benefits of increased digital nomads to Latin America? And I'll peg an additional question onto that was, which is, do you think that there was actually just an unusually low number of foreigners in Mexico and in Latin America prior to a couple of years ago. And now we're just getting to basically like an, a normal average number that's still probably less than the percentage in Boston or, or Austin, Texas or anywhere else. Um, I don't, I don't know that I think even before the pandemic, there were signs of a lot of um, American and European immigration into the, into Mexico, because if you see a place like, have you ever been to Mazatlan? I have. Okay. You, I hadn't been there for like 10 years and then I went and it was a very changed city. And from talking about, from, from talking with people that, um, live there, it, that was definitely more of a development that was due to immigrate to 
people from affluent countries immigrating. So I think it, 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 we have been seeing it. Maybe the pandemic definitely accelerated a little bit now that not just retirees can move to the U.S., I mean, to Mexico um, to, to spend their 401k. But now literally anyone, or not anyone, but many people in the tech industry can move there and work from there and earn in dollars. I think that's definitely going to... Uh, yeah, accelerate. You, you should do some charts about uh, the immigration numbers because I think there's definitely some surprising revelations. Like uh, I, I just saw one the other day that it's really only been like 8,000, 10,000 people a year that are getting residency in Mexico, mm -hmm. Americans, mm -hmm. which is like an incredibly small number uh, right. re relative to what people um might think well, it would be like ten thousand in a year. That's like nothing because I, I wonder how many of like them are official numbers of people actually doing it correctly and getting a visa, and how many are just like people that go to Mexico for one or two months and they don't really have to do, they don't really have to get a visa technically, mm -hmm. and are just there sort of temporarily. Like I'm very curious. Because that will not show up in the data as much. Um, yeah, well, yeah, you can do like airport entries. Um, airport there's definitely entries. Some, some ways to get the metrics. Yeah, and, and that is definitely up in terms of travel to Mexico. Like Mexico is the only country in Latin America that, or if, if not the only, but the one with the biggest recovery since the pandemic. So like they're actually, they ha they're having visitors above pre-pandemic levels and flights into the country. So there are definitely some signs that um, it, it's hard to know how much of that is just tourism versus like, I want to work in Mexico for a month, mm -hmm. but no doubt that that's been happening more, right? Arrivals by year would be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think we've done a chart specifically like that. That is a timeline of, whether arrivals have increased, but thanks for the idea. I'll definitely uh, look more into it. We, we've made one, and that's, I think, the one you alluded to where it was just like 10,000 permits. And I agree, it's not a lot. The growth is there, but sometimes it's just directional, you know, like there's more visas officially being registered, but behind all those visas, there's also a bunch of people doing it maybe in a more gray area sort of way. Mm -hmm. but I would love to get a more concrete answer. No, you're totally right. Um, so for the uh, entrepreneurs listening to this, digital nomads who are obviously enthusiasts for Latin America. Um, oh, by the way, uh, Telegram at My Latin Life, Twitter at My Latin Life. If you send us a message on Telegram, we can get you added to our Telegram group um, where you can get more intel on Latin America. But Ernesto, my question what would be, my audience is very tech savvy. They're very entrepreneurial. They're making money online. They're living in Latin America, but often they're not necessarily interacting with the local economy that much. They're not building businesses in the local economy all that much. Certainly yeah. some of my guests have been uh, a lot of people doing Airbnbs, for example, but not too many people. Um, I want to get more Latino tech people on the podcast, but I also want to get more of my audience involved in the, the Latin tech community, right? Because like I we have very talented entrepreneurs and they're they're chilling by the beach in Mazatlan or whatever they're doing, right? But they're not necessarily interacting with the local tech ecosystem. What advice yeah. would you have for these talented entrepreneurs that they could maybe start, I don't know, like networking with the Latin venture capitalists or getting involved in the uh, accelerators and incubators or other startup hubs in Latin America or just sort of getting involved in the local economy in some way? What what advice or thoughts would you have? I love, I love that sentiment of being more involved uh, with the locals. I think that's, that's great. And ideally that would be something that happens naturally uh, when when people like you visit the country, the reality is that it's hard to put oneself in those situations sometimes. But I think the the best way to this is finding allies that are in the entrepreneurship 
uh, path in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I think the best way to do that is in these different hubs in Mexico. I think in Mazatlan, honestly, I would, I would have no idea how to find that profile of a local. But if you go to Monterrey, there are really good schools here, people pursuing their MBA, also very interested in uh, entrepreneurship that I'm sure would love to, to uh, meet people like you. So I think Monterrey, Guadalajara, and Mexico City are the, the three that I would say the most logical places where one can find those opportunities. Unfortunately, being outside of Mexico for eight years, I'm not super connected, but let's think about that. I mean, that's a, I think that's a very interesting opportunity, right? Because, I mean, we both have this audience of, of people that are professionally very impressive and that have a big interest in Latin America and, and that want to see it develop. So I would love to think about with you ways in which we can make form those connections because the opportunity is there. I have an audience that uh, both is interested in Latin America and, and people in Latin America. So how do, how do we connect and make it more of a community? That's something that I think about a lot with Latino metrics. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to make it more of a community. I wish I did. I think that's a full-time job. I wish I wish I could have someone um, sort of taking charge of that. I think in the future I will, but that that is a challenging part of um, sort of connecting these these people that are um, visiting and and the the locals. I don't I don't think I have a great answer for you, sadly. It's going to happen, man. I'm going to get more uh, VCs and entrepreneurs in Latin America on the podcast. So everyone listening, just stay tuned. Please subscribe. Um, Ernesto, tell us about uh, the future of Latino metrics and some of the ideas that you guys have for the future and things that you're excited about. Yeah, um, there's it's, it's honestly pretty uncertain at the moment. We definitely want to maintain what we've been doing. We've, we will. But in terms of new places where we can go, I think I just alluded to one, which was building more of a community and uh, opportunities for, for people to meet and actually creating more interactions between the audience and between us. Um, that is one. Another business, in, in terms of business opportunity, we we think there's a big one with research. I think there's a big problem where there's all these papers that are written and they're like 200 pages and they're barely ever read. And mm -hmm. so I think there's an interest by research institutions to have that work distributed. And we've been talking with a few of them to, to sort of uh, help with that. I think with our storytelling skills and social media presence and audience, we have this opportunity to, to highlight some of the great research that people do about Latin America. So that's, that's another one. And who knows, man, I, I think the storytelling part of Latino metric can be applied to a lot of things. I think if you gave me like a million dollars, I would love to make like a documentary, start producing a podcast, you know, talk to, experts about the subjects that we cover i think that's something that i would love to do is um like for example we're talking about the uruguay drop in informality can we bring someone that's an expert from uruguay to talk about that and, and tell us because right now we're just sort of like googling things and reading from these sources trying to understand it and then writing about it but having someone that's an actual authority on the subject Mm -hmm. would be really cool and, and, and perhaps uh, uh, an opportunity to make more yeah. different types of content like video or audio. That would be pretty cool. I would love to do that. Are you familiar with the podcast uh, Planet Money? Yeah, uh, NPR, right? Yep. Yeah. I could see you guys doing something like that, almost like a Planet Money for Latin America. Right. I like that content, right? It's very short. Maybe 20 minutes, right? Each, mm -hmm. each episode? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. 
I, I think that would be great because, and they, I haven't heard it in a while. Do they also bring in uh, guests for every episode? Yeah, they bring guests. They kind of have, I think they kind of have like two hosts. I think it's, it revolves a bit, but they kind of have two hosts and then they bring people on and there's different voice clips that yeah. help highlight different points and stuff like that. And it could work because you got you and your cousin, right? Los Canales. And uh, you guys could kind of like go back and forth. I'm sure you guys have great chemistry and then you bring someone else in. And uh, I, I think it could work because I, I almost feel like what you're, the content that you guys make is almost like planet money, but in data visualization format, in chart format. Yeah, no, I, I love that idea. I think that would be great. And the, the idea is every chart has a story surrounding it. I think that you can tell, and there's an opportunity to also zoom in. So you're, you're looking at a trend from the outside, mm -hmm. but, there's an opportunity to zoom in to the people that are actually yeah. experiencing this trend. Definitely. I think that that idea is pretty cool. So yeah, I love that idea of planet money. I'm going to re-listen it to, to see if I can get some ideas. Yeah. So Ernesto, um, dude, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. I think this is a really interesting, special episode for us because, you know, you, you kind of represent, not only the startup community in Latin America, but also the more formal um, business and economic community in Latin America. And um, this is a direction that I want to go more is, is to have more um, business and, and financial content as part of my Latin life. So uh, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your thoughts and, and the stories and how you guys got started. Um, at this point in time, why don't you uh, direct people to where they can learn more about Latino metrics? Well, thanks, Vance. I first want to thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's my first time podcasting, so it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I had a lot of questions that I wish I would have asked, but uh, you redirected it to my way. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's weird for me to just talk about myself, but I would love to at some point meet you more to learn more about you. But where you can uh, learn about us is just literally just go to latinometrics.com. Um, some people like to follow us on Twitter. We, we, make pretty, we try to make really good Twitter threads. And if you wish to support us, the best way to do that is to subscribe to our newsletter. Consider like just a monthly subscription is $5 and you can cancel any time or you can subscribe for a year for uh, $49. So. Uh, that would be the best way to to stay in touch with us and you can uh, reach me at directly on Twitter at EG Canales on, on Twitter That's all right. I'm not very active personally there I spend most of my time on the Latino Metrics um, account but yeah I'm always open to ideas or collaborations anything yes and uh, one note, the Latino Metrics tw Twitter, the handle is LATAM Data. So yes, LATAM Data is the Twitter handle. But as we discussed, you guys are big on Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, website, Substack. You guys have your bases covered. Yes, we do. And we're, we're trying to get that Latino Metrics handle. Elon Musk hasn't responded yet, but uh, <laughs> I get it. LATAM Data. Somebody... Made it a long time ago and they don't use it. Dude, I'm, I'm so uh, bullish about what you guys are doing for the future. I think everyone listening needs to go sign up and read through the back catalog and, and look at all you guys' old um, uh, graphics from the past year and a half because they're all super, super fascinating. Uh, you guys could easily be charging double or, or 6x uh, the amount you're currently charging for your uh, weekly newsletter there's there's simply that much value there thanks a lot man man that that means a lot thank you so this has been another episode of the my latin life podcast again our de our guest today was ernesto canales from latino metrics thanks for listening